This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. Philosophy Bites is made in association with the Institute of Philosophy. If you study engineering, perhaps you'll invent an ingenious widget that'll improve the lives of millions and may even increase national GDP. If you study philosophy, well, frankly, what good is knowing about Schopenhauer or epistemology going to do you? Surely then, it's a positive development that under budgetary pressures, Western governments are squeezing university humanity departments. The distinguished University of Chicago professor, Martha Nussbaum, thinks not. Martha Nussbaum, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Hi, Nigel. It's very good to be there. The topic we're going to focus on is the humanities and why they matter in a democracy. First of all, who is the enemy here? Who could think that the humanities don't matter? Well, I'm afraid that the humanities are being cut back in pretty much every country in the world. And they're being cut back because the attitude to education that now dominates is that education is about building short-term profit. And so the skills that we want are the ones that help our nations and individuals to make short-term profit in business and industry. And the humanities look like they don't do that. So this is the result of people doing cost-benefit analysis and, and being naive about what possible value the humanities could have for an economy. Well, yeah. I mean, I have no objection to cost-benefit analysis if you get all the costs and all the benefits lined up. But I think people are not thinking about the long-term cost to democracy that we get when we cut back on the humanities. Democracy requires a certain kind of self-examination a certain kind of critical ability. Socrates in ancient Athens, which was the world's first democracy, noticed that people were making decisions very hastily. They were doing what people always do, that is deferring to tradition and authority. And he wanted them to stop and analyze what they were saying and really ask, what do I stand for? What is my view? And uh, to do that, you have to learn skills of argumentation. And you really have to lead the examined life, as Socrates said. And for all of that, you need philosophy. Now then, I think the humanities supply yet other ingredients for successful democracy. They supply a knowledge of world history, which we badly need if we're going to come to grips with the problems that affect the world today. They supply a knowledge of the major world religions, which help us avoid narrow stereotyping of other religions that we are not familiar with. And then finally, and I think in a way the most important of all, they cultivate our imagination so that we are not obtuse toward other people, so that we can see the world and think how it looks through the eyes of someone who's different from ourselves. So let's take those three areas that you discussed. First of all, there's the critical thinking that comes from the kind of dialogue that particularly philosophy teaches. Then there's a sense of world history and understanding our place in relation to other cultures. And thirdly, there was the idea that imagination is important, that we need to have a sense of something beyond our own perspective. Yes, I think that captures it very well. And of course, those are interconnected because you don't understand history well if you simply learn to repeat by rote some narrative that someone feeds you. You only do history well when you learn to do it critically and to think, how do I assess this evidence here? And then finally, you you only do history well if you do it with imagination, trying to think about what you're learning as the experiences of real people. So I think the the philosophical critical aspect, the historical aspect, and the literary artistic aspect enrich each other. But with Socrates, he was deliberately a gadfly. I mean, he annoyed his contemporaries. He made life difficult for people who stopped people in the marketplace. They were confidently going about their business, thinking they knew what they were talking about. And he showed that they didn't. Now, is that valuable in a democracy? Isn't that actually obstructive to have people constantly niggling away at the consistency of people's arguments and the coherence of their definitions of terms? Well, I think it's immensely valuable because democracies cannot survive if propaganda is allowed to hold sway. Politicians are often bringing bad arguments one's way, and you need to be able to look at the argument. There's also the question of how we interrelate. In my country, the U.S., people are often relating to each other 
with sound bites. They see political argument as a way of boasting and scoring points for their own side. And that's not good for democracy because it makes people think of the two parties as contesters on a playing field rather than on, as people who are trying to figure out what's good for the country. If you think Socrates' way, then you'll think, we'll take the argument apart and we'll try to figure out what's the difference between your side and my side. Now it might be, let's say we're arguing in the U.S. about the death penalty, that the two sides share certain premises of their arguments. And if we get clear about what is shared and where the differences lie, then we talk respectfully and we don't just see the other person as an enemy. But to play devil's advocate, I mean, there are some philosophers who are very skillful at reasoning. Frege, for instance, or possibly not such a great reasoner, but Heidegger as well, who, despite their learning, despite their education in philosophy, ended up with some pretty extreme anti-Semitic viewpoints. They were, both of them, very sympathetic to the sort of thinking that emerged in, in National Socialism. Well, I'm glad that you said perhaps Heidegger wasn't such a great reasoner, because I fully agree. I think there was nothing Socratic at all about his procedure. What I'm recommending is the study of Plato's dialogues, of the contribution of Socrates, and the study of good moral and political philosophy that asks us what justice is and teaches people how to think about the utilitarian theory of justice, about Kantian theories, about theories that treat the human being as an end rather than a means. And people should learn to argue with each other about the relative merits of those theories. And they should do it in a democratic way. Now, I think the thing I actually object to the most about Heidegger was that he was a guru. He practiced philosophy not as a Socratic practice of exchange where you and I are equal and it's just a matter of who has the better argument. But no, he was an authority figure and he fed people's desire to submit themselves to authority. So I think actually his way of teaching was anti-philosophical. So this sense of dialogue is incredibly important in philosophy because from outside, some people think that to learn philosophy is to learn what the great thinkers of the past thought so that you almost kowtow to those people that you are in awe of them. Well, if that's the way it's taught, then that's bad teaching. But I actually think most philosophy teachers don't do that because we are brought to the subject by a love of Socrates' questions. And I think, uh, you know, one, one loves seeing students come alive and learn to be troublesome and learn to ask those questions. And uh, actually, I think one of the best things to teach is Plato's dialogues, because they don't let you stand still. You don't know what the position actually is, and you really have to figure it out for yourself. And so you couldn't it would be very, very difficult to teach it in a kind of um, authoritarian way. Does that apply even to teaching children? Because I know there are a number of people who are teaching philosophy, maybe not calling it philosophy, but teaching it to primary school children, to very young children. Don't they need certainties before they dispute things? Well, I think children can awaken their critical faculties very early. Because, of course, when you learn to grow up and if you're in a good family, you learn to love your parents, you're learning certain fixed points of love and attachment and that is very important. But you better be learning to question at the same time because your own parents might make some very bad arguments. My own father was a racist from the Deep South. So while I certainly loved my parents and I learned certain fixed points from them, I also quickly learned that I better be questioning the arguments that they gave me. Let's move on to the second area that you raised with the humanities, the idea that we get some kind of cultural knowledge that allows us to understand our place in the world. That doesn't come so much from philosophy. Which sorts of humanities disciplines encourage that way of thinking? Well, history above all, but I also think economics and the study of the history of religion and comparative religion. Boy, that is so important because certainly in most of Europe and the U.S., if you ask people what a Muslim is, they give you an extremely crude answer. And I really think that all children very early should be learning to understand the variety and complexity of the major world religions. And as far as history is concerned, they need to learn the rudiments of world history. But then I think it's very useful to learn how to inquire in much more depth into one unfamiliar culture, because you can't possibly learn everything about every society in depth. But you need to learn the kind of 
ignorance that you have. You need to learn, for example, that you don't really know what a family is. When I went to India for the first time, I understood that what a household is, what a family is, was something quite different from what it is in the U.S. The house is open to callers at all times. The sense of family is much more porous. It embraces the whole village. So those things are the kinds of things that people should be learning about one culture, and then when they get to a different one, they know the questions that they need to ask. What if I don't want to be a citizen of the world, though? That is your position that cosmopolitanism is a good thing, but there are people who want to be narrowly nationalistic about this, and they say, look, We've got to focus on the local and the very specific conditions of our, of our own history. Well, I would understand cosmopolitanism as the position that you should always give your first loyalty to the whole world and not to your nation. Now, I don't even hold that position myself. But nonetheless, we're in the world and we're making decisions all the time that affect the other people of the world. And so even if in the end of the day we want to do it in a way that promotes the interests of our own nation above other interests, we better know what choices we're making. And we better know how the decisions we make about consumption, about energy use and so on, are affecting the lives of other people. Then we're really making a decision. Otherwise, we're just going by authority. What about imagination, though? Plenty of people live their lives without ever reading and engaging with a novel or watching a play or reading poetry. Are they the worst for that? particularly in relation to to democracy, surely they can know about society without knowing about T.S. Eliot. Well, what I'm looking for is the ability to put yourself in the shoes of somebody different from yourself. Now, that's an ability that actually is part of our evolutionary heritage. Apes have it, elephants have it. We come into the world with the basics of that ability, but it's often in a very crude form. We might quickly take on the ability to read the mind of our parents because every child has to try to figure out what is my mother thinking now, what is my father thinking now. But often we don't extend that to other people that we come into contact with. And particularly in every society, there are groups that we almost deliberately freeze out of our imaginations. The great American novelist Ralph Ellison wrote a novel called Invisible Man, and it was really about as he put it, the inner eyes of white America, which made the black man invisible, meaning they just saw him as a thing, as a body, but didn't try to imagine the inner experience of suffering under racism. Now, that is promoted, of course, not by every piece of literature, but literature in general trains the muscles of the mind. So I think even reading T.S. Eliot expands your imaginative capacity in a general way. Martin Nussbaum, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nigel. There's now a Philosophy Bites book published by Oxford University Press. For more information, go to www.philosophybites.com. For more information about the Institute, go to www.philosophy.sas.com. Dot ac.uk dot